between. Uh, my name is Mark Kapsinski. I'm filling in as your moderator today. Uh, my own personal background is uh, uh, I come mostly from the venture capital community. I help run UCLA has a venture capital fund, and I'm also doing a startup in the uh, uh, social media content creation space called Story Mill. So if you see that referenced, uh, that's my company. Happy to chat at any point about that later. Um, but today's focus is on these fine folks up here. Um, we're going to be talking about deals, deal making across the whole landscape of media. And so um, we have a number of topics that we're going to cover as we get through those topics. Uh, if you do have a question, just kind of signal me. We'll get to questions at the end, so I'll make sure to kind of remember who has some questions and we'll call on you towards the end of the session. But we're going to go for about you know 45 minutes or so straight, then we'll uh, open it up to the floor and then uh, go from there. Um, so with that said, we're going to uh, have each of the panelists introduce themselves and then we have kind of a thesis that I've thrown at them to uh, get things kicked off. So we'll do a quick round of introductions and then uh, we'll kind of come back to our thesis and then uh, kind of dive in from there if that sounds good to everyone. So Mimi, do you want to get started? Tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and your journey to get here. Hi everybody, it's nice to be here. Uh, my name is Mimi Steinbauer. Uh, I started an international sales company about four and a half, five years ago called Radiant International. Um, and I've worked in the international licensing space about 20 years, uh, working for companies like New Line, for Warner Brothers, Village Roadshow, and a couple of smaller companies as well. And what we do is the international sales on uh, primarily feature films. Uh, we're involved in everything from getting the projects into Radiant and also helping the producers finance films. So we get involved in a lot of different aspects of the deal making. Uh, my personal journey, I'm from Austria. Um, I worked in production in Austria and decided I wanted to work on bigger English language films. <laughs> so I came to the States and went to the Stark program at USC. Um, and then started working at a number of companies that were all doing some aspect of production and distribution. Um, and that's what I've been doing and started my own company about, as I said, about five years ago. Terrific. Thanks, that's me. Maybe welcome. Alyssa, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi. I am Alyssa Goodman and I'm a little bit hard to define right now. I used to say that I was an independent producer and now I almost feel I have had to become what many people are finding they have to become, which is almost an independent studio, where you have to create your own content, you have to find your own financing, find your own production and distribution. And most recently, I developed a script, I found money, and I wound up directing a movie that's called The Standoff that is now in release through distribution on social media, um, uh, you know, digital platforms. I use social media stars for marketing, and so the movie seems to be doing very well right now. It's, it's a little too soon to tell, but I'm going to take a leap and say it's doing well. My background is in working in distribution. I've worked for an animation studio called RGH Entertainment. We did sort of small, mid-budget, uh, 10 to $25 million movies, which I used to go out and pre-sell um, in order to bring in the money to create the financing. I work with different distributors as a consultant, um, or different producers as a consultant to find the proper distribution for their movie. Um, everything from strategizing on cast that's marketable to story points that are marketable and then taking them through the delivery process to distribution and finding the smartest deals and you know whether it's going through festivals and so on. I've kind of done a lot and wound up there mostly out of opportunity. I think that this is a business that everybody comes to do one thing in and then finds opportunity someplace else. So for me, I started working in distribution at Miramax years ago. Then I came to Los Angeles and started working in development at Universal, produced TV movies, and moved on to do some reality television and feature films. And every opportunity I find you know, takes me in this other direction and then redefines me, who is, I guess, best described now as a work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, definitely a, a, a plethora of, uh, of things going on there. So, terrific. Uh, Harrison, welcome and tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, my name is Harrison Land. I uh, work for a full service uh, nonfiction production company called Jupiter Entertainment. We have offices in New York and Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, 
We do a lot of cable and broadcast, mainly in the documentary and reality space. We have 14 series on the air and a couple broadcast specials and pilots. And um, I started out working in the Knoxville operation where the company started. And then over time, we were at capacity and, um, and we had sold a series and we needed to find some editors, writers, producers to make it. So I moved up to New York and opened up that office and about five years ago and the rest is history. And I head up the development of the team. Thanks. Harrison, what are some of the shows that you have right now? Just you mentioned we have, you have a ton. So. Yeah, uh, we have uh, five series on Discovery ID. Uh, we do their number one show, Homicide Hunter, uh, about uh, Detective Joe Kenda. We do Snapped on Oxygen, uh, Killer Couples, as well as Hashtag Killer Post. We have four series on TV One, uh, Fatal Attraction, and Justice by Any Means, so a lot of murder. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and so Crime Pays, and, um, and so, yeah. Terrific. Well, thank you. Welcome. You. Jamie, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Great. Uh, my name is Jamie Burke, and I am a co-founder and co-president of Lifeboat Productions. My partner and I started Lifeboat about five years ago. We are a full-service production company, which means that we can take a project from inception, develop it through completion, which is a fully finished product that then goes to distribution. Um, prior to that, I started my career also at the Peter Stark program at USC. <laughs> and uh, from there I went to 20th Century Fox in feature film development. Um, from there I went to independent filmmaking, which was at its heyday when I started at about 2005, 2006. And then quickly uh, took a huge downswing when the stock markets crashed around 2008, 2009. Um, and out of that ebb of work uh, came a digital revolution and the phoenix uh, that I started working and I'd produced four of Michael Eisner's um, digital studio, Vuguru's projects, uh, where my business partner was head of production. And out of that, uh, she was looking to make a change and get back into the, the gritty, get your hands dirty side of things. So she came and partnered with me. And since then, we've worked with some of the biggest um, digital native studios. Our company ha does produce digitally, and we're proud of it, but we also do traditional television and features as well. Great, welcome. Leo, wrap us up. <laughs> um, my name is Robert Leo Rogers. I'm uh, the long ranger here. I, uh, I'm more on the music side. Uh, I'm the senior vice president and label liaison at Bungalow Universal Music Group. Uh, we've been a part of uh, Universal uh, about 17 years. I've been with the company about 14. Um, we sign independent uh, labels uh, for distribution at Universal. We have distributed over 500 indie labels, and that means taking them from A to Z, from Alpha to Omega, from studio all the way to breaking number one records. And we also have uh, a we, Universal, before um, they sold a Vivendi, which was the film and distribution arm that we had, sold it to Guyam, and it left us without a film and distribution division. So what I did, I went out and found distribution partners on the film side, and we became an aggregator, and we have distribution partners uh, all the way from many indies up to uh, Sony and uh, Lionsgate. And we currently have about three um, titles in the marketplace uh, that I'm managing and uh, trying to uh, take them to the finish line. Terrific, well, welcome. So um, that's a little bit of, uh, about the folks up here and myself. Um, just a quick show of hands about the folks in the audience. Um, you know, who, who here is sort of a content creator, whether it's in traditional film, TV, digital, music? Okay, a lot of folks from that space. Anyone from the advertising space? Any advertise? Brent? Okay. Uh, technology kind of folks? A few? And startup-y kind of people? What, me? Okay. All right. Uh, so we have uh, mostly content creator uh, types, so uh, kind of use that, keep it in mind. Um, so what I'm going to do is, uh, maybe I'm going to start with you. Um, we kind of talked about this in our prep, but um, 
you know, in my summation or my thesis, I guess, is, you know, there used to be this old studio system and, you know, you'd like write your script and then you'd go to the studio and someone would give you a check and then you'd be able to produce it and you'd own all the rights and then someone would help you distribute it and you'd make a bunch of money and it was great. Like, is that still the world that we live in? And uh, I remember how, how those would you days. characterize the uh, sort of the deal making uh, culture uh, that we're now li uh, living in? And uh, we'll go down the whole panel and get your takes on that. So, uh, um, maybe start us off. I think um, the most interesting thing right now is that no two deals are alike, uh, which makes it exciting. It makes it a little bit complicated to figure out. But I think every deal that comes together now. Um, on the getting a film made side is comes together differently. Um, we, at least from my perspective, just as an example, we premiered two, we had two world premieres in Toronto last month. One was a film that we'd been involved in for about 18 months called Carrie Pilby, and that was one where we helped put the financing together, um, helped do pre-sales, they did the rest through soft money out of New York State. Uh, there was a bank involved, there was equity involved, so that was a, a project that we were involved in about 18 months. Finally saw it premiere in Toronto. The second film we had premiere in Toronto is one called Handsome Devil, uh, which was a film that came to us completed. Um, so it was a completely different uh, deal for us. It came to us completed, we screened it, we loved it. It was producers that I'd worked with before. Um, and so in that case, they had put it together with uh, Irish Film Board money uh, and some equity. So there was, again, on their end also, the deals were very, very different. Um, so I think there's no yes and no answer to what you said, that every picture comes together differently. Um, and it also depends on what are you trying to do with that film. Is it a traditional theatrical film? Is it made for the digital space? Is it, you know, what are you trying to make? Is it a series? Is it, is it non-scripted? What are you doing? And each of those comes together differently. But there's no easy replication of deals the way there used to be, at least in my world there isn't. Um, so I think each deal that you get into, whatever phase you're in, whatever stage you're in, is, uh, has to be put together in a pretty original way. Quick follow-up, uh, just what do you think the hardest, or, or not really the hardest maybe, what's the starting point for you in one of these? Because, you know, like in all the descriptions, it feels like we overlook the story or the talent. Does it all start at the story and then converge around the story, or is it around the talent or the rights or the like? You get financing for just from your experience. Um, I started Radiant um, in order to we were we handle about six to eight films per year, and for me, it's very much about the content. I want to do quality projects that are uh, do have a traditional theatrical life, and so in that case, it's very much about the content. Uh, it's about the story. It's about the talent. Um, talent is more and more important in terms of selling international rights and the value. Um, so for me, yes, for me it's very much about the content, um, not always the case for everyone. But for me that's where it starts, is, is it a story that I like and do I see an audience for it? Because there's so many films, that, so many projects we look at that I don't understand who the audience is other than the person who wrote it and his or her mother. Um, and so it's like, who, who is going to pay money in whatever platform to see that, to watch it? Um, and so that's a key piece for me is that I like it, I find it interesting, um, and that there's an audience for it. Terrific. Thank you. Alyssa, tell us your story about deal making and how does it work for you? Well, as Mimi said, there really is no one size fits all, fits all deal right. for anything anymore. I think that you know when it when it came to my own personal journey, I think my biggest frustration was as an individual. I went to a studio, brought them a project. They said, "Hey, we love it," and then suddenly there were you know very expensive lawyers involved in doing a lot of things, and I'm not really sure whether I got a good deal or not. Um, you know, honestly, I'm very proud of what I did. It was a movie called The Cinderella Story that was done for Warner Brothers that has led to four sequels now, so that's kind of exciting. I wish I would have known there'd be four sequels when we made that first deal, because uh, they were not included <laughs> entirely, and every time you have to go up for negotiation all over again. But my frustration there really was that I'm just a little person with an idea that somebody decided they liked, and then I had to sort of navigate my way through remaining involved, honestly. 
And that was a challenge for me. So I kind of went off to doing more independent movies because I wanted to be a bigger part of the process. And I think that that then creates new deal-making opportunities for you, which include you own the movie, but then you have to start parceling off different pieces of it. So when you're making smaller movies, you have to figure out where am I selling this and what kind of deals am I going to get. So when I took you know, raise financing for the last movie that I had directed, I went to an international sales company so that I knew that they would be good for a certain portion of the budget because it was really important for me to make sure that my investors were gonna get their money back. Um, so we went to an international sales company and gave them those rights. Then domestically, we went to another company and they took getting out, you know, putting us out on all the digital platforms and going to iTunes and you know, whether it's Netflix or whoever it'll wind up being, but Amazon and Google Play and all of these places that now exist, which is kind of exciting to get your film out there. Um, the, we then went to Sony who took DVD. And you can say, is DVD worth anything anymore? I'm not entirely sure, but they're putting it in Walmart and that's kind of exciting. I don't think we'll make money off of it, but that's the other side of what you have to look at with your deal making is it, everything from the very beginning is a deal. When you're optioning a screenplay, that is a deal. And I've always found as a producer that that very first deal you make is sort of how the rest of your film goes. If you, you know, get a cruddy deal with a writer, suddenly you're going to have talent wanting more and directors wanting more. You know, you really have to keep a tight rein on your deals, be fair, be smart about it, and get it out there properly. But there, there's just a deal for everything. And you know, I was saying earlier when we were speaking, and, and for me this was a first time experience because I had such a hands-on um, role in this movie was you're making a deal with SAG about how much of a bond you're going to put up. You're making a deal with a lab because the lab is going to do a QC of your movie and then they're going to fail you and then they're going to do another QC of your movie and charge you more money. <laughs> and, and so there, there's just deal making is everywhere. And so for me, I went off and made my own movie because I didn't love the deals I was getting out of Warner Brothers or the participation. But as an independent producer, those deals might not be so bad <laughs> because they do so much for you. You know, as of this morning, I was out, you know, doing some social media promotion and pulling pirated versions of the movie off YouTube. So having so you, some... You're doing it all. <laughs> you're doing it all. And, you know, having somebody else taking a little less so that somebody else does that. But, but I guess really the point I'm trying to make is there's so many considerations you have to have that you just have to know what you want and what your end goal is, I think, and work backwards from sure. there. So, so, quick question then. Mm -hmm. So, with all this complexity and stuff that you had to do, uh -huh. did you enjoy it? I had the time of my life. All right. Well, then, <laughs> then it makes it all worthwhile. Yeah. All right. Uh, Har Harrison, yeah. tell us your, your scenario for deal making. Uh, you know, maybe kind of talk also broadly about television these days. Yeah. It's kind of that's your, your right. area. Right. And I mean, oh, I'm different, I guess, than, than most because we still we are at the mercy of the networks. And, uh, and so, it starts with the idea, and then if you have the relationship and you know there's a market for it, uh, you go, we go pitch the networks, and then hopefully they like it. Oftentimes they don't, and uh, you hear no a lot. But, um, and so if they do like it, then, uh, then they give us the money, and we make our, you know, our profit off the EP fee. And so, uh, so we kind of know where that money's coming from. The deals, so in that regard, they're all kind of, you know, they're very similar. But what we are seeing is more brand-funded, uh, you know, long-form television, and we're also seeing we're also seeing the opportunity to license shows to smaller networks, and then you know, and then uh, deficit finance some to retain those rights. And so we're seeing the model change a little bit, but um, but for the most part, ours, you know, cable deals and broadcast deals are a little more traditional uh, than than you know, feature film certainly. So, I mean, it's interesting because, like, one of the pieces that you, you mentioned, I don't know if everyone caught, but, I mean, you're basically making most of your money off the executive producer? Yes, yes, so yes. So, where else does the revenue come from for you, or, the, you know, where else are you making money in all this sort of effort that you're putting into? Oh, I mean, that, that, that's it. It's 10% of the budget of, the, of that it. episode. That's so, if, if it's $100 per episode for this show, uh, the, they get, the network gives us 110 and we use 100 to make the show and $10 to and, you know, put into the company's pocket. And so that's, that's where it is, unless you come in, unless you bring in, uh, unless you deficit finance and retain the international rights, which we've done on four or, four or five of our series. And so, and that has become, you know, is, is certainly a business and you get to own something. But, you know, a lot of 
TV, your work for hire. You, know, you don't own IP, the network owns it. And so for us to retain those international rights, it's, you know, it's kind of something that we're really interested in. I think the future you know, is really in rights retention. Do you think, just one more quick follow-up, yeah. do you think we're ever going to get back to sort of the days of like the Carsey Warners and the you know, <laughs> true independent television production business? It, it, with the right idea. With the right idea, I think that's still possible, but, uh, but across the board, um, I, don't, I don't believe so. In the unscripted space. Yeah. Um, but with the right idea, I think anything is possible. Good. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks, Harrison. Jamie, tell us uh, your story and your scenario around deal making. Sure. Um, well, when I started in feature films, it was um, you would make a feature film and a large portion you would get back revenues from foreign. You'd also get a lot of revenues from DVD and tape sales. Um, since that time, the market's completely shifted. And I think it's more exciting than ever. There are more distribution outlets than ever before. There are more exhibition opportunities than ever before. Um, the difference is, is that no longer really are you taking a script to a studio. You still do, the bigger ideas. Um, and they're handing you a bunch of money and that, that's that. You now have to look at the entire marketplace and decide which, which is the best place and the best home for your idea. Um, and I completely agree with what my colleague said is in regards to content is still king. The idea is still king and the story is still king. The exciting part is, is there's more opportunity to sell that idea than ever before. Now, your profit participation and your revenues back in may be limited due to it being more of a niche market. But because I have found personally and we have found that there's more opportunity for sell, it's become more of a volume game and less than a one-shot roll game, so. So you almost have to take like a, a slate approach mm -hmm. to it versus just a maybe one, like almost like what Alyssa's done with one particular project and it's her passion project versus right. if you really want to make money, you got to like package up a lot. Is our business is very much based on a volume, volume thing. And of course, in our series, we hope for subsequent seasons and to follow those traditional models. And by the way, it's becoming much more seamless between traditional marketplaces and digital marketplaces. There's no question about it. Um, however, it's, um, it is a content volume game in that you, you need a few in order to keep your lights on now, as opposed to just your one big shot, unless you are going for the bigger studio gambles. Got it. Thanks. And Leah? succeed. Oh. <laughs> Leah? Okay, I'm going to give you the gorilla marketing version of it. You know, I got good news and I got bad news. Um, the, good new, the bad news is that a tr the traditional film deal where you script approval from the the production of the film company and they approve you get budget released and you hope that you have enough to you know to make the film and deliver it on time uh, there's a few of those around not many um, you have to have a major track record with that film distribution company to get that and you know where you turn into film you get MG's minimum guarantees that's the bad news the good news is that Controlling your own film, your destiny. Before I worked for a major, I was one of you. I was that independent guy beating the doors, trying to get somebody to pay attention to me. I had to go, I produced my own TV show, raised my own money, got a, went to NAFTA, got distribution, syndication deals with my TV show, um, learn, you know, learn my lesson, lick my wounds. And, and found out the hard way that you still can make a film and still do deals, but in today's market, trying to control your own destination, controlling your own content is key. You tr everybody wants to try to have the film distributors give you a whole bunch of money up front. You don't want that. You'll never see a check on the back end. And the upfront money is almost nil to none. Go out, raise your own money. You may, that's why when you see films and TV shows, you see about 30 EPs, executive producers, <laughs> because you have to use that many people to raise money. But it's, at the end of the day, you're better off having 30 EPs and, and, and splitting it up that way. Because if you go and you try to get money from the, from the distributors, 
be between the PNA and, and all the funny money, you'd never see a check. I'm giving it to you real with no, with no chaser, okay? <laughs> so you're better off controlling your own, going out doing licensing deals, film festivals, going in international market doing pre-sales, and just cutting deals with distributors say, okay, I'll give you North America. You, I want to carve out international. You're not getting it. They may, if you're strong enough resume, they'll go for it. But controlling your own destiny and not worrying about trying to get the upfront money because those days are over. You got to hustle. I have my independent filmmakers and distributors. I'll issue your LOI for distribution. Go find your money and come back to me. Okay, so then where do you go find the money, Leo? Give us, give, give us the hot tip. Well, you, you start with folks like you. <laughs> <laughs> That's one. What, many VCs and angels won't touch films. If it ain't technology, technology. driven, trust me, I've been there. Technology. It's got to be tech driven. Uh, you, you, you go and you find, I mean, I'm going to keep it, I'm going to really keep it real with you now. You may have to go on the streets and find undercover money, okay? <laughs> so there's many ways that you can find the money. Uh, friends and family, you can go to conferences, put ads out, uh, bang the bushes, and uh, you, you just have, it, the money is out there. There's somebody out there that has a lot of money, Silicon Valley money, that want to see their, their name and lights and fame, and they always had uh, uh, an, an interest in being in Hollywood. A lot of the tech guys want to be there. <laughs> hey, that's why I'm here. <laughs> um, so it, just kind of building off of that, I mean, how do you guys react to that and, uh, you know, sort of Leo's notion, you know, that, you know, you got to go find the money. Is it that easy, that hard? I mean, what are the, what's sort of the best routing to go? And Alyssa, why don't we start with you because you did this all on your own most recently and kind of let's go to everyone else. Um, I think that in Hollywood, a lot of agents and managers, and specifically attorneys, know where money is. Um, there are a lot of attorneys um, who work as almost like producers' reps in some way. They rep different clients. They put their clients together. Um, so they can bring in a lot of private equity. I, I find attorneys are really good with that. Um, one of the first non sort of Hollywood traditional movies that I had produced was funded by somebody who was the heir to the Orange Glow fortune, oddly enough. Um, you know, and, and they wanted to be in movies and so they funded it. Um, the last movie I did was actually The Writer's Cousins. So it just, everybody has a different path to their money, but outside of that, there's obviously soft money and tax credits and things like that. Um, you know, you've got different states throughout this country now who are really competitive. Canada's still there. Um, you know, everybody comes up to me and says, oh, I've got money from China, though I've never seen that materialize. <laughs> uh, but people talk about it a lot. Um, and for somebody, it may materialize. It hasn't for me. But I think that those are places. But the first thing, you know, the first step in really raising money is having value, which is your project. So what makes your project valuable? Obviously, you know, it's the package that's involved. Do you have a known screenwriter who has been able to deliver in the past and, you know, has credits that you can promote? Do you have actors that you can put a value on? So, you know, the story is, you know, you start with the story, that's the most important thing, but the place you can put value is the package. So that somebody like Mimi can say, well, okay, the last movie that we did with this team, this producer or this director has made X internationally, so it makes her job easier to go out and find you money and help with your pre-sale. So I think that the first thing you just always have to do is have something that you can put value on, um, you know, and hopefully then you can sell your aunts and your cousins and your dentists <laughs> and then take soft money and take pre-sales. You know, it's, it's usually more, there's banks. Um, movies are usually, if they're not through the studios, and even the studios do it, they yeah. just do it on a different level, but they're funded from so many different places in so many different ways. That's been my experience. Jamie, do you want to comment on this? Because, I mean, this is part of your role, right, in terms of bringing in financing for your projects and so on. 
Um, yes, we are a little bit less of the bush beater, even though a lot of respect to that method, 100%. You mean you don't go for undercover money? <laughs> <laughs> that's, I, that's I plan to talk to Leo after. <laughs> we're going to have a sit down, coffee. <laughs> um, but yeah, there is a lot of value to owning your own library and your own IP, absolutely. Yeah. And when we started, we often you know, just sold our project to the highest bidder, and we're happy to take upfront fees with m very marginal backends, and you know, it served us well. At this point, five years down the line, we're now very much looking at how can we build our own library and then keep that and monetize that in a much bigger, it's our next goal of scale. Um, so, yeah, there is a balance that you have to do. The good news is, is that the, uh, the independent film market still is tried and true with your incentive raising your ec marginal equity. If you need a bank loan based on foreign sales, foreign sales, all of that, you can pretty much cobble together a way to make your product. The thing that I would urge everyone to do is to have a realistic game plan to make your product, though, and keep your budget line as low as humanly possible. That's the best way to get the highest return on your investment, is to not spend extravagant money on things that are unnecessary. Now, of course, names are going to help you sell. That's money well spent. But, you know, a, a big trailer for yourself, probably not money well spent. So, yeah. Got it. Mimi, do you want to touch on this, too? Yeah, there's a lot of talk about pre-sales, which just to, to tag on to what Jamie said, the pre-sales are, are at this point difficult if you don't have big names or a really original project. So it's, uh, it's getting harder to do pre-sales. Ten years ago, you could pre-sell pretty much anything. Um, and now it really has to be original, exciting, or very, very big. Um, and then this whole model falls into place. Otherwise, you are looking at soft money. We do about a third of our projects are out of Europe, where there's a lot of um, country subsidies and incentives um, from European countries. So you can put something together that way. There's um, Central America, Latin America. There's a lot of different international subsidies as well for making films there. So there's different ways to cobble together that money. But the, the nod to pre-sales just from the trenches um, that has to be a, some, a, a special project. So either wildly original or very, very big with known mm -hmm. names. And then that model falls into place. But um, the equity piece, there's a lot of money out there. Uh, it's really just finding the right uh, money guys for the project that you're putting together. It's either because they're passionate about it, because they like you or are related to you, um, or that they, the, you, that they see the guaranteed financial return. So there's different ways to hook them in, um, but there is money out there. So it's definitely, it's definitely there, whether you're beating bushes or not. <laughs> yeah. Harrison, do you want to touch on this just from the television point of view? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, we go to the cable networks. Traditionally, uh, we go to the cable networks and the broadcast to get them to fund at least 70% of it. And then, and then from that, we'll, we're in conversations with people like Sky or people like Fremantle to, uh, to then hopefully give an advance for uh, the international. And then from that, we have our full production budget. And then the you know, more of the profits come over time because we're licensing it to different territories. And so, but traditionally, it's cable network and, uh, and then we'll, you know, hopefully deficit it and, um, and have an advance against, uh, against it to cover our production. But no bush beating, though, either. <laughs> so, so, um, so we've kind of talked a lot about, obviously, features in television. Um, you know, maybe I'm going to start with you, Jamie, again. Um, because you kind of brought this up uh, in our uh, prep, what's the role of digital here, and like how you're shooting things, and how you're how are you approaching maybe digital as part of the overall deal making that you're doing? Absolutely, I'd say that it's from my own experience, it's becoming an enormous piece of anything we do. It's become a distribution outlet that has filled a bit of the DVD tape sales. Um, we had an interesting conversation that I'll save for them in terms of uh, internationals not quite caught up to the di digital distribution model. But here domestically, it's an enormous piece. I mean, everyone, Netflix and Amazon and all of those are very much part of the distribution deal that you're going to make. What, who is going to own the digital rights and who is going to sell them? Um, so in terms of the production thereof, it's interesting, my partner came from a traditional television world. I came from a feature world, 
and each project benefits from both of our backgrounds in terms of knowing the series models, et cetera, but we often have to shoot them as features because it keeps your budgets down and your return on investment high. So if you're shooting eight episodes, which we just did, we shot it over the course of 40 days, and we now have an eight half hour series that's gonna release on Audience Network, which is AT&T's digital. Uh, cable channel. So it's becoming much more homogenized in terms of its production um, methods, I would say. And then based on that, you, uh, you have more opportunity for the outlets. Got it. Leo, what's your take on where digital is in this space? Um, I, th I think digital is, uh, you know, I mean, it's pretty much ubiquitous everywhere. Um, you um, when you own your own digital content, um, it's, you know, it's a double-edged sword. You, you can propagate it everywhere with no control. I mean, because once it's out there, you got to deal with the bootleg and, 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 and the, you know, the sites that can hijack your product and, and sell it, and you never get, collect a dime from it. Um, you know, you can, uh, but but the the bright side of it, you can you can license it, and you don't have to worry about you know mastering and beta, mastering and one inch, all those costs <laughs> of the physical stuff you don't have to worry about anymore. You know, you can you can stream it, and, and you can just just mainly distribute your product. Uh, but there's a, there are a lot of formats, you know, from Voodoo, Hulu, uh, Netflix, and, and Redbox. They all have their own formats that you have to comply with. Um, but overall, you, you, it's a cost saver versus uh, having to master uh, your films on all the physical formats that, that, used, to, that used to exist. And, and you, can, um, uh, you can distribute and propagate it. Uh, a little more cost effectively controlling is a whole nother, that's a whole nother story. Alyssa, you were mentioning uh, you, you were pulling down pirated copies. Oh, yeah. Uh, and can um, you kind of touch on your experience with digital? Well, digital is really interesting because I think it covers a lot of ground. I have um, specifically designed the last movie I did for the digital market because you can go out on your own and go to, there's companies like Juice and Ubiquity and Distriber. You can put your own movie out there. Um, you still have to worry about pirating and all of that, and you know there there are a number of ways to deal with that um, that are semi-effective. Um, we've, according to some sites I found, we've been hit by about 50,000 illegal download views on our film to date right now. It's been out about three and a half weeks, so it's really frustrating, obviously. Um, I don't know necessarily if all of those people you know, sat through the whole thing. Would they have bought it anyway? You just can't worry that much about it. But there's other digital content that fits you know, different boxes, so to speak. Um, there are these two girls that were in the movie that I had done called the Merrill Twins. They're these twin sisters, they're YouTube stars. And they put on a show every Tuesday, they drop a new video and they have millions and millions of followers. And, you know, it's short form content. They're trying to build into a new show. They're working, you know, with Awesomeness, which is a digital network. So you just have to sort of find what the right platform for you and you know, is or for your project. The other thing that's changing is some of the digital platforms change how they, how you get paid from them. Um, for example, right now, um, Amazon uh, Prime pays you as the filmmaker per minute of viewing. So for me, you know, instead of, instead of turning around the way Netflix was doing and giving out license fees for, you know, we're going to buy your film for two years for 50 to 150,000, whatever, you know, it is for a small independent movie, Prime is saying how many minutes are watched. So it's kind of, you know, it's just changing so much. Google Play goes by minutes. Um, you know, everything is so different that digital to me, really covers a lot of ground, and I'm almost forgetting what your question was already. I'm just kind of all so over. Your but experiences in digital and your... Yeah, and so, so everybody's different. Pirate. I mean, I, I saw somebody, Mike, walk in, who I know in the audience. Hi, Mike. He makes digital cartoons, and they're picked up by, I think, you're with DreamWorks, right? And he's found a way to turn that into something.
Yes. You know, so it's just sort of, you know, they're, they're you know, um, webisodes, I guess, basically. And so digital covers so much, but the one thing that everybody forgets when they get their digital is marketing because you can't just put it out there. It is such a huge marketplace where you've got, you know, all of the quote unquote influencers that have digital content. Um, they're on Vine and YouTube and places I've never even heard of. And, you know, and, and there's Musical.ly and this and that, and there are these people that are becoming stars and influencers for their digital content. And then the question is, where is that going? Are they translating into more? What will they become and what's the value? So there's so many different things, but when it comes to like the movies and TV content, I think it really comes down to marketing. People have to know where to find it, know that it is there, and that was one of the reasons that I chose to, when making a movie about teens, was use some of these kids, because they have such a huge following. Um, we've got about close to 20 million social media followers for the cast that I had, and we really needed that cast to mobilize and get out there and promote the movie so that people would know it's there because we're not dealing with the studio P&A fund. And so you have to be more creative and that's what we chose to do. So I think that digital has so many benefits but there are so many different versions of what digital content is and because any kid with an iPhone can create digital content and get it out there, it's how are you being noticed above and beyond all of, you know, from the fray. I mean, how does digital factor into your deals? Because you're dealing mostly with international, and I think Jamie kind of touched on international still maybe isn't ripe or ready or, or yeah. mature enough for it. Um, What's your international is in some ways catching up to the states. I think they're about 12 to 18 months behind the U.S. There's different reasons for that. Some of it is purely technological. Um, and that there simply isn't the infrastructure in certain countries uh, to be able to quickly download a film, to watch content. Uh, so that's just plain a, a infrastructure question. Um, certain countries also have laws about windowing, uh, which is, you know, we're seeing it here as well, but there's, France is, there are certain mandatory windows, theatrical has this, video, DVD has this, um, so they're by law windows, which is still catching up to what is the reality of how does your actual consumer want to watch a film at this point, um, or any kind of content, a TV show. Um, the platforms don't necessarily exist. Uh, Netflix is now global and everywhere except North Korea, I believe. Um, so it's, it's the platforms are getting out there, uh, but it's not, it's not abundant. There aren't a lot of choices like we have here in terms of getting digital content and watching, con watching the content. Um, and then um, the idea of marketing is that a lot of international uh, distributors, uh, content owners, et cetera, don't yet know how to reach the young teenage girls from 12 to 14 in their country. So that's a bit of a catch up as well. Um, so there's a lot of things um, in certain aspects, some international countries are ahead of the U.S., but a lot, uh, they're playing catch-up. And so the monetizing digital uh, distribution is, is uh, not as clear yet internationally as it is here. DVD has gone away most places. Um, certain countries, Japan still loves actual hard copy DVDs. Um, <laughs> most countries have moved to being able to stream stuff but it's not as easy. So international is catching up with, we've lost certain traditional methods of monetizing. We're not quite there yet that you're making it off your Netflix or other, or there's no Hulu or whatever that is. So it's like, where do you make your money back on content? So international is, is, is catching up. Harrison, how does uh, digital affect you? Uh, previously, it wasn't an area that we, you know, we were really focused on because the economics, uh, you know, in our case, doing, you know, long running, you know, hundreds of, like, Fatal Attraction, the 100th episode premiered the other day on Monday. And so, uh, and so we traditionally do a very long running series. And so the economics never made sense previously uh, for, you know, for us in the nonfiction uh, and reality and documentary space. And so I view it now as kind of what cable used to be, is almost the wild, wild west. It's a really an area for opportunity and legitimate buyers. Netflix budgets are, you know, far over, uh, you know, what Discovery would pay, uh, you know, for the same type of content. And so I think their budgets have, you know, have come up to where cable was. And so really view that as an opportunity as well as not being locked to a traditional clock is, is really exciting because there are certain stories that need to be told in four minutes. And so that's really exciting as a storyteller that you can 
be, you know, you can produce content, you know, um, and tell it the way it's supposed to be told versus, you know, a five or six act structure. And so, does the deal structure in television differ in digital for you? Do you think, or does it give you other opportunities for monetization that you won't won't have going through traditional cable? So, yes, I mean, I think that you you do have an opportunity, where, like, where you to bring a brand and have them fund, you know, uh, you know, the content. We we did a, uh, a project for uh, Food Network that William Sonoma fully funded, but we we didn't retain the we didn't retain the underlying rights to that. And so, uh, whereas if we brought that to Pana or which is a food app, you know, perhaps we could negotiate that. And yeah. so, I think they're flexible in each distributor. I mean, you guys have dealt with them more so than us, but, um, but each distributor doesn't have a traditional model yet, whereas in cable, there's kind of an, an old, old way of doing things, and, uh, and so that's kind of why it's exciting and, and reminds me of when cable was yeah. you know, first starting. So um, it's kind of interesting because we've touched on a number of different facets, and uh, you know, there's all these like, little components that all wrap up into this like, one big thing we're calling a, a deal. Um, the thing that I guess the, the sort of the question I have, and I, Leo, I'm going to pick on you first. What's the goal? It, like, it, it feels like when you're talking, your goal is I got to own the IP, I got to own the content, right? Like, I might contrast that with Harrison's goal, maybe to get distribution, right? And he's okay, maybe not owning the IP, but he's got distribution. Like, so I'd love to get everyone's take on sort of what's your goal with what you're doing and getting your deals done and made. So. Well, I'm going to pick on you first. Well, it's, it's, it's twofold. On, on, the, uh, on the music side, let me yes. just talk about the music licensing, which we do. The, the, the music side, the goal is to get a top five record on Billboard and make money. You know, because you can have a top five record on Billboard and lose money. <laughs> uh, so on the, on the film side, um, it is, the goal is to, and remember, I also act as a consultant for independent filmmakers. We're also a film aggregated distributor. Uh, the goal is to try to be as fair as possible to the filmmaker and allow them to make, we don't want to be the only one to just make money and the filmmaker doesn't make any money. Too much of that has happened. The goal is to have a situation where money is made and shared by everyone. Um, you know, I, I hear the horror stories all the time. You know, you spend a half a million dollars making a film, and the filmmaker never see a dime for five years. <laughs> it's too much of that. So we're trying to change the model. Let's share in the revenue. That's the goal. Awesome. Jamie, what's your goal? Sure. Um, I think our goal is always to create high, high quality content that can serve multiple purposes. One is certainly to make money. Um, the second, though, is maybe there is a different end goal for that content. So perhaps we'll take a risk of, uh, on a filmmaker or on a piece of IP that will get an opportunity. Also, the goal is to find the best distribution partner that will give it the be best chance in the marketplace through marketing or publicity or whatever it may need. Um, but to take that risk that will then give us or the filmmaker the opportunity to make something else. It's to keep surviving in this industry and to keep making content that makes you relevant and successful so that you can live to make your next show or your next film. Survival's the goal. Yeah. I like that. Okay. <laughs> Harrison. Um, our, you know, our first and foremost, our goal is to tell great stories. And, um, and then second to that, we, we do have uh, an investor with, with Sky. And, uh, and so obviously we, need, we made promises to them. And so the objective is to also make money, but doing so while telling you know, great stories. It's the only reason any of us got into this business. And, uh, and so. Do you think it's hard to find that balance? I, it's always, I mean, I think. I mean, I think we all love great stories. We right. love telling great stories. But like, you know, is it really hard to find the balance of tell a great story and make money to pay for it all, and, and almost to Jamie's point, survive? Right. I think that we view we view everything kind of like a, like our stock, your retirement portfolio. We you need your stocks, your bonds, and you know, and you can yeah, you, know, you need to diversify, and so you do need something, as you said, to keep the lights on, and those are more your bonds. But your stocks, you can take a little risk, and so. I I think, and those are the ones that you, you know, that you'll take a little more risk, and you know, but it's a story you know 
that needs to be told. And so I think it's all about diversifying. Got it. Good point. Melissa. I agree with everyone thus far. It is survival and telling great stories. Um, we're all probably here because we're passionate about filmmaking or television making or content creation in some capacity. And in order to get to do that, survival is kind of the key. So it's just finding the right, you know, wrapping it up with deals, finding the right deals that will enable us to do that. That's good. Mimi? And I'll add to that, and our goal is certainly to have good quality film seen all over the world. Um, so we have sort of that eye to get it out to as many viewers as possible. Um, but it is, it's good quality projects, stories that should be told, and then of course everyone needs to make some money doing that as well. Got it. Well, we have a few minutes um, uh, before the end, so maybe we'll take a few questions. So if you have a question, maybe raise your hand, maybe you can stand up, tell us your name, the company that you work for, and, and then your kind of quick question, sort of straight to the point, so we can get a few of them done. Uh, right here. Question. Uh, I'll take a shot at it first. Okay. Um, so, so if I understand you co correctly, you're, you're asking how do you monetize your music, your content? No, 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 I'm asking, I'm saying that's what we do. We uh -huh. monetize music and we have media partners. So right now we have like 37 television series. We control the music world. But we find media creators, content creators, and there's a process that we determine who are a good match. And then we help them to make money that's a reliable asset called music to monetize and then fund even future and other productions. And I'm asking if any of you, I didn't hear that mentioned in a panel on... So sort of the role, role of music, I guess, in all this. Oh, okay. I understand. Maybe a quick answer, Leo, and then we'll go to... Yeah, so... so uh, Basically, you you act sort of like a music supervisor, licensing company. That's what sort of like what you guys do. Okay, we're, we're, maybe take this offline because it's yeah, it's getting a little do. too complex. Yeah, so. yeah, we we do Watch our producers you. our producers do. So it's twofold. One is contribution to the f film budget. So that's definitely our our savvier producers use that, and then the music publishing rights uh, down the road. Either also our producers are either. Um, gets the revenue from the music publishing or we collect it for them as a revenue source. But yeah, our producers on the feature, independent feature film side definitely um, are aware of that and use that as a contribution to the budget, to getting the films made. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No, it's Great. a good option. Yeah. Okay. Is it completely independent and self-financed? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so you probably have a genre, you probably have elements therein, yes. right? So what I would do if I were you is look at the, other, the content distributors and see if any of them match the elements of what you have, whether it's a horror or a comedy, those type of things, and then take it to that market or the people that work with that market in order to give you the best shot at getting it in there and then distributed. Can you put it online, though, mm -hmm. sacrifice future distribution and licensing deals? Uh, it can. However, it sounds like if you self-financed your web series, then you probably are willing to take that risk. And there are people in all companies, I dare say, that are constantly combing for content. So if it's good enough, 
it will get seen and found. And then that it isn't so much seen as a hindrance depending on what market share you get with views. So if it's a minimal view, high, high concept idea, and somebody snags it up, they'll tell you to remove it and then they can take it and distribute it, or they'll have you remake it or remake the idea with elements that they choose. But it's not a bad way to get seen. The other way is if you put it on and it becomes a, a social media sensation, then they'll also want to work with you as a filmmaker. So I don't think it's a bad option. You may want to, however, at first attempt to get to one of the bigger platforms and see if they'll distribute it. And if they won't, at that time, you can determine to take the risk and, and self get it out there on YouTube or whatever. Great. OK. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question, ma'am. Name? Oh. OK, great. So one more question, uh, ma'am, right here in front. <laughs> Anyone? Leo, is that an option? Uh, I, you, the crop crowdfunding for a film, I mean, there's several people that have used crowdfunding for film. Um, it's not as easy as you think it is. You, you have to bring on like a crowdfunding consultant. You know, people think crowdfunding is that, you know, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding is, is you, you, you get a website and you blast it out to a couple of folks. It's not that easy. <laughs> So uh, we're almost out of time, but I would like to give each of you guys one sort of last opportunity to sort of share. What's your best advice for folks as they head out of here? Maybe what's that one quick thing? Mimi, we'll start with you and kind of go down the row. So, Mimi? Um, I think the most important thing that I also have to keep reminding myself is that everything is negotiable. So every single step along the way is negotiable. So just remember that there's not really anything set in stone. Uh, and not to be gender discriminatory, but the women out there, there's a book, I have no connection to anything, but it's called Women Don't Ask, read it. Um, <laughs> it's about the fact that a lot of us men also don't ask for stuff. And it's like you can ask for it and you can get, even if you get 80% of it, good for you. So that's my two points is everything is negotiable. And especially in this marketplace where everything is in flux, really everything is negotiable and figure out what you need and ask for it. Great. Thanks. Good tip. Alyssa? Um, deal making. Make sure when you discuss things with people that it's in a contract. Um, I've, I've had some personal bad experiences and seen some other filmmakers have bad experiences, especially with some distributors, because there's a lot of um, distributors out now who have this big beast to feed with all this content. And they want your film, they're gonna throw it out there. Nobody up here would do that, of course. But a lot of companies will, they're just trying to like get as many films as they possibly can to feed a certain deal. And as soon as you sign on the dotted line, everything that you've talked about, whether it's marketing or things like that, kind of go by the wayside. I had a distributor promise me that they were gonna do all of these things and then all of a sudden, as we were ready to release the film, oh yeah, that wouldn't work. No, that's too expensive. No, that's this. I mean, I had a distributor call me four days before a film was about to be released saying, so what do you think we should do for marketing? And, and that really happened. Um, I, I'm not, you know, and it's like, you're asking me, <laughs> you know, isn't that why you're here? Um, things like that, okay. things they promised early on that, you don't necessarily put in a contract because they don't, you don't think they need to be, but pay attention to that stuff and get it in the contract, whether it's making a talent deal or a distribution deal, whatever deal from beginning to end. Good. Know what you're talking about. Good tip. Harrison? Um, the best advice I got, you know, I have ever received was probably that you need three things and, you know, you need to know, you need a good idea. You need, uh, you know, you need to know the person with the, pay, the, you know, with the checkbook, and you need to know the people who are talented enough to execute. Because you, the worst thing you can do is sell an idea that, you know, to a buyer, and it's unproducible. Because uh, you're going to want to sell them another idea down the road. And so, 
Um, so if you have that triangle, and you know you don't even have to be any of those three, but uh, you know then you're you know that was that set set us up for success. Terrific, it's Jamie. You're constantly selling in every single phase of this business, whether you're a writer, you're an actor, whatever you're doing, you're a salesperson. So you have to believe in what you're selling, because if you don't, the person that is supposed to buy it never will. And then second, always check your references. To her point, always call people that have had their films distributed by that distributor. Always call and make sure that the director that you want to hire can actually deliver your product. Always check references. That's a good tip. Leah. Um, the best advice I can give you is to, to try to control you, most of your own content. Uh, tr I mean, but partner with major distributors, but try to control the direction of where you're going with your product and take as little money as possible up front and control it. Terrific. And, so, and uh, have fun because it's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be passionate about it. Well, uh, we're out of time, but uh, definitely want to thank everyone for coming. And how about a big round of applause for Mimi, Alyssa, Harrison, Jamie, and Leah? Thank you guys. Thank you.